I want to talk about Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, today, and I'm going to want to backtrack just a little bit and talk about solar systems. If you were to believe that a solar system such as ours actually forms up the way that you taught in school, from a swirling disk of solar material under the influence of gravity, you would expect the spin axes of the planets to be roughly perpendicular to the plane of the system, and that's not the case. You have the Sun and Jupiter and Mercury, which does look like that. You know, the spin axes of, you know, the axis tilts of those three bodies are, are less than 10 degrees. So you have to assume that the Sun and Jupiter and Mercury are an original system of some sort. You've got two planets, Venus, which is basically upside down, uh, you know, it rotates backwards, axis tilts 180 degrees more or less. And you've got Uranus, which is laid over on one side in 90 some degrees. And those two bodies have their own special separate stories. And then you've got the four main planets, which are Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth, which all have axis tilts around 26 degrees, I think about 24 to 28 degrees. And that strongly indicates that these bodies were captured as a group at some later point. And what Troy and I are proposing is that they simply were still in this kind of a, an axial alignment at that time, which are called part of a herbic arrow string. And simply flew into the plane of the sun system from the south at a 26 degree angle, more or less, and as the individual bodies were captured by the sun and spun out and began to orbit the way they do now, they simply kept the 26 degree axis tilt. That, that's more or less what you would expect. What that says is that early on, our solar system was in two parts. You had a northern part, which was a very bright part, the sun and Jupiter and Jupiter's moons in particular, and the normal thing in our galaxy is for gas giant planets like Jupiter to be much closer to their main sequence stars than Jupiter and Saturn are to the Sun now. So that you assume without all these other bodies that Jupiter would have been much closer probably within the habitable zone of the Sun. Um, you've got a very dark part of our system which is Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth. And once again, for a rocky planet like Mars or Earth to be associated with, I don't want to use the word orbiting because that's not really what was happening, that these things were in a herbic hero type of alignment, which was governed by electromagnetic forces. They, they weren't governed by gravity or, 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 you know, they didn't amount to any sort of rotating system, the way our system is now. Um, for a rocky planet like that, basically you're going to be inside the heliosphere, the plasma sheath of the dark star. You're not going to freeze to death, you're going to have radiant energy bound, you know, directly from the dark star and also bouncing back from this heliosphere so that all parts of the planet are going to receive radiant energy, but the entire middle part of the light spectrum simply isn't going to be there. You know, you're going to be living in a very deep, dark, purplish kind of a world. And in fact, this seems to be the world that a number of our oldest types of animals were, were clearly adapted to. I mean, the huge eyes that you see on, on dinosaurs, and, and not just one or two of them, all of them, even the flying dinosaurs, even the herbivores all have these same huge eyes, which are like the eyes that you would see in a giant squid, you know, that lives deep down beneath the waves and has to be able to see in darkish environments. Um, even deer. Right, deer's eyesight is heavily canted towards purple and ultraviolet. And in fact, deer can see ultraviolet light perfectly well. Of all the money which is spent on hunting paraphernalia, the least well spent is on camouflage deer and, I say camouflage gear. And a lot of this is being made in Asian countries where nobody really goes out deer hunting. And what was happening a number of years back was that they were using chemical treatments on a lot of this camouflage clothing, which left an ultraviolet sheen on it. And of course, Bambi would take one look at that and he'd be gone, bam, I mean, just, and the hunters were dumbfounded. So what in the world is going on? Is it no sort of, that Bambi, you know, just like waving a red flag in front of a bull, right? I mean, Bambi would see that and he was gone. Bambi normally sees motion very well, but he sees forms badly, if at all. 
so that I've spoken to people who've actually shot deer with white shirts and ties, you know, with bows and arrows and then a white shirt and tie just to prove them themselves could be done. And I've had white-tailed deer walk up to within 12 feet of me before they ever saw me. Um, you know, eventually they will see you, but sometimes it gets to be real close. So basically they were adapted to the same kind of a purplish world. Now humans and dolphins have the smallest eyes relative to their bodies of any advanced animals, okay? There's simply no way to believe that humans would have originated in this dark half of our solar system. I mean, any kind of a creature, whether you want to believe in evolution or whether you want to believe that God created these creatures, it doesn't matter. That is not going to be completely ill-adapted to its home world. Okay, you have to assume that humans came from the bright side of this early solar system of ours, not the dark side. And that says that the first thing you really want to look at is Jupiter's large moons, which are called Galilean moons. And the largest of those is called Ganymede, and this is the thing which Trenna Claflin set out to investigate early on. And I mentioned several things in a previous video about an original home world that would have to be bright, would have to be wet, since humans are primarily aquatic or quasi-aquatic aquatic creatures. And it would have to be safe. In other words, humans would have to be able to live in this original world without all the technology, you know, without even ladles, without even, you know, much of anything. That says, uh, and particularly since humans are quasi-aquatic aquatic creatures, there can't be sharks, there can't be stingrays, there can't be any of the, uh, you know, any of the things you would see in the ancient sea monster exhibit at the Smithsonian Museum. None of that stuff can be there. A couple of other things that you would want. I mean, the place would have to have a, an oxygen environment, and there are enough traces of oxygen around Ganymede to assume that, that, that it did in ancient times have an oxygen environment. There's another funny kind of a thing, too. I mean, humans can swim in salt water, but it's not really good for us, right? I mean, you'd like to have a freshwater ocean. And that appears to be the case with Ganymede. I mean, there's very little in contrast to some of the other bodies that you see around Jupiter and Saturn, there's very little if any sodium around Ganymede. So that early on what you really had saying there was a kind of a paradise. You had a fresh water ocean world with you know with oxygen and with light coming from two bodies, both the dark star Jupiter and the Sun. So you know, I had a bright environment. You had a safe environment. And there are a couple of other things which you want to try to explain about Ganymede, which Troy, I believe, has just done a masterful job explaining. And what, I, I guess, you know, you've, you've got to explain the intrinsic magnetosphere. That, that's the other safety feature that, that you have, like with any kind of a body which is a home world for humans. You've got to have something to cut out the cosmic radiation, particularly in the neighborhood of a major radiation source like Jupiter. Um, the intrinsic magnetosphere is sort of rare in our system amongst rocky bodies, and Ganymede and the Earth both have them. That's one thing. It's like you've got to explain this ultra-low moment of inertia of Ganymedes, which says that most of the mass is concentrated towards the center. And the normal means of explaining that doesn't really work. The normal explanation for this is that you've got some kind of a 600 kilometer deep outer mantle of salt water around Ganymede. And the claim is that this produces not only the, um, the ultra low moment of inertia, but it also produces the conductivity, which is assumed to be necessary to create the intrinsic magnetosphere via some sort of a, a dynamo process so that the normal assumption, both for the Earth and for Ganymede, and I, I guess maybe Mercury, is that the intrinsic magnetospheres that you find in rocky bodies are created by a dynamo process, and these magnetospheres, according to that theory, should be, you know, they shouldn't be decreasing, they should be continuously being topped off. Now, on our own Earth, we know that that isn't the case. We know that our own magnetosphere has apparently decreased by 10 or 15 percent over the last couple of hundred years, and this could eventually become some sort of a problem. Um, what Troy is proposing is that this outer mantle is not salt water, that it amounts to pumice, which is actually lighter than water, and that you have this 
giant outer mantle of pumice being created by these intense Birkeland currents of the early system, right? I mean, just a kind of electromagnetic flame. Uh, and, you, you know, at some point, you, you ended up with a planet. <coughs> you ended up with a planet which had both floating bergs and anchored islands of pumice. And rock normally isn't conductive, right? But you get conductivity along the surface of rocks, which is created by what you call pee holes, you know, which are explained in cosmos and collision. I don't really want to go into that right now. But pumice is like the radiator in a car. It's all surface, right? In other words, you've got a gigantic ratio of surface and volume. And this would, uh, the, the, this would amount to as much conductivity as you would need for an intrinsic magnetosphere, which is not being continually topped off, but which was fused in early on by these same Birkeland currents. I mean, after they weakened enough, so they weren't just going to keep the planet in a permanent state of being fried or anything like that. Now, if you go around looking for things to worry about, which you don't have any real control over, you know, like reasons for paranoia, then, then there are all kinds of things that you could come up with. Um, I'll tell you what my own two favorites are. One would be this question of of intrinsic magnetospheres, like are we going to lose ours somewhere in the next two, three, four hundred years? Okay, the other would be, you know, my own recommendation would be genetic entropy, the, the question of you know, like what happens after another 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years of the human race, basically just going through mutations at the rate at which it's going through them now. You know, I once had a co-worker who was about as much of a hypochondriac as you could want. I mean, they would no sooner discover some new disease in Borneo that he would have to go get himself checked out and then get second and third opinions. And he had a girlfriend who was more of a hypochondriac than he was. And, you know, this is in Washington, D.C., and this girl lived, like, in first alphabet, you know, above the letter, you know, whatever, and was building a bomb shelter in the basement of her house. And William asked me one day, he walked up, there were several people listening to this, said, Holden, you're the only one here that's ever had any physics, right? He explained this whole thing, right? And he said, what exactly, if anything, does Sally Ann need for a bomb shelter? And I said, just one thing, William. I said, a tube of lipstick with which to kiss her honey goodbye. You know, like Max Factor number seven or something like that. At any rate, like I say, my main choice for something like that would be, you know, the intrinsic magnetosphere. At any rate, 50, 60, 70,000 years ago, Ganymede had all these kinds of things. It was as perfect a world for human beings as you could possibly want. And that's, that was the good news, at least in those days.